All right. I want to just back up a little bit. Um, and nights here. And just give you a little bit more information. What day is today, people? Twenty-fifth. All right, Tristan. Yes. Yes. Thomas. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yes. Two in a row. Where you're looking 
as to which term you might see these skills that we're talking about now sit under. And it can get a little bit confusing if you're reading around. onto their stomach. And so by about seven months, they might be getting up on their hands and knees. Um, the first thing you typically see when they start to get up on their hands and knees is they get up and then they fall back on their haunches. But what you see is them rocking. So they're on their hands and knees and they kind of rock backwards and forwards. Now, the rocking is quite interesting because if that's the first time they've really taken their weight on their arms, then the brain has to work out how do I contract the shoulder muscles and the triceps so I don't fall flat on my face again? So you don't see creeping as soon as they get up on their hands and knees because first the brain has got to work out, now what? Right? What do I do now? Creeping is not always the first form of self-locomotion. Sometimes you might see crawling. Crawling is when they manage to kind of wriggle along on their belly, kind of like army seal, getting under a cargo mat or anything, you know, where you drag yourself along on your hands and your belly and your legs kind of drag on the floor. Right? So a lot of children will do that once they've started lifting their head and their shoulders up and they can see things. Then they want to go play with it, explore it. So many of them will develop that crawling idea before you see them get up onto their hands and knees. So I get up onto my hands and knees, I've got to have a little bit of time working out what this means, strengthening my shoulders, strengthening my arms, working out how to turn those muscles on and off. Okay? And then by about eight months, I'm going to start creeping. So, on hands and knees, we all know what creeping looks like. I was hoping they would also have... Um, right, I'm having a rather large battle with IT today because they messed around with my computer. Right, so, he's on all fours and... Here we go. Very fun. All right. So anyone who's got kids or has family members where you spend a lot of time with them and their children will know that once this happens, life is never the same again. Right? Because it used to be so much fun when you could put this blog down on the blanket and go away and make a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and come back and the blog was still on the blanket, right? Well, once it's self-locomoting, life is never the same. There's no more turning your back because heaven only knows where they're going to go, right? So, 
life changes. Feel that nice chubby fat cells we put on there, chubby arms. So, around eight months. This is very similar to the idea that we talked about when we looked at fundamental motor skills earlier on in the semester in lab. The ages are an average. What we see happen with infants is more age dependent than what we see with our fundamental motor skills, but there's still a strong element of individual constraints and environment and individuality, right? So it's around eight months. Some children might creep a little bit earlier, some might creep later, some don't creep, right? Creeping is not one of the skills that 100% of humans do, unlike standing and walking. Right? Some children will skip creeping because they're strong enough or motivated enough or whatever happens within their little world and they just stand up and go straight to walking and they skip the whole creeping thing, right? Other children, depending upon the environment they grow up in, might not creep and they might bum scoop instead. So they sit on their bottoms and they drag themselves along by their heels, right? Because it's more effective. What would make the difference? Do I creep on my hands and knees? Do I bum scoop? What do you think makes the difference? What do I need to bum scoop? Environment. Think environment. Slippery floor, right? So if I'm going to use the carpet here, because a hard floor would hurt my knees. So, you don't see so many children creep if they grow up in a house that has hardwood floors or ceramic, a tile floor. If I'm a child on a shiny wooden floor, then bump scooting becomes very, very efficient. Because okay? my diaper slides along the floor and it leaves my hands free which is a big bonus because now I can do all kinds of things I can get into everything I can carry something with me whereas if I'm a creeper and I want to touch something or pick something up my brain has to work out how to shift my balance where do I put my center of gravity so I can take one hand off the floor without landing on my nose? Right? So the brain learns different things depending upon the environment that the child is brought up in. I had a friend whose daughter bum scooted. It was hysterical. It's the funniest thing to watch. And she could go fast. Oh my lord. She could get across the kitchen like nobody's business. All right, so keep thinking, you know, it's not just the skill. In order to do the skill, I have to be getting stronger. I've got to be motivated. I've got to be interested in identifying things or exploring things. By around nine months, most children are going to be able to pull themselves up to stand. No, that's not what I want. Play the video. So she's transitioning from creeping 
into pulling herself up to stand because she wants to get and explore the thing that's being dangled there. Okay. So again, when you watch them at this point in time, often what you see is they'll pull themselves up, but they haven't, like the brain can't control all these wobbly bits yet, so they'll stand there and kind of, okay? So that takes a little bit of time. They have to practice pulling themselves up. That means they need things at the right height to pull themselves up. And again, depending upon the environment, how big, how much furniture, or how small, right? Then you'll often see them start to, once they've got a little bit more stable here, they'll start to move around the room. It's is called cruising. Right? So as long as they can get to the next piece of furniture, they'll stay here. If they pull themselves up on the couch and they cruise all the way along the couch and then it's a ways off to the table, they'll drop back down, scoop over to the table, pull themselves back up again and they'll cruise along the table. Right? So what you see depends upon the environment that they're trying to move themselves around in. Okay. So that idea of the constraint that the child is growing up with is going to change maybe what patterns of movement behavior you see from that child. Right. They're nearly at the age where I find them more fun. We're almost there. <coughs> So 10 months, they should be able to stand alone. So if you help them get up, or if they pull themselves up, they're going to be able to start taking their hands off the furniture or standing up for a minute if you let go of them. Right? They've got enough idea. It's not conscious. It's their brain learning. Right? The brain's got enough idea of what the heck to do with all this so that they can stand. Okay. And on average, by about 12 months, they're going to walk on their own. Right. You'll see them walking before 12 months, particularly if they have access to push-type toys. They'll walk holding your hand. But on average, it's around 12 months before they walk without holding on to anything. There's some research. Um, it's quite old now, but it's not the really old stuff where they've done quite a lot of work with that step reflex. If they train the step reflex, does a child walk a little bit early? Probably yes. That led to some very interesting data that they worked on up at Ann Arbor at Michigan State where they were working with Down syndrome children and they created a little mini portable treadmill and they would loan them to parents whose children had Down syndrome when they were young so that the parents could work on the step reflex with the baby on the treadmill because Down syndrome children stand and walk but they're very delayed compared to a typical child. So the idea was if we could train the step reflex, we could help them to walk a little bit earlier. And that's what they found. And then these parents used the treadmill to help the Down syndrome learn to walk well. And it's a really cool body of research. So if you work with atypical or adaptive kids, that kind of information is out there to help you out. All right, where are we going? Okay, so we'll come back to that idea of rate limiters. Right, when we're looking at these skills, what are the rate limiters? Right. The rate limiter is an individual constraint, something that's going on within the person that 
slows down the attainment of a motor skill. So at this end of the lifespan, when we're looking at infants, individual constraints are changing rapidly. They're growing, they're getting stronger, right? their nervous system is developing, myelination of the nervous system is occurring, so their responses to things can be a little bit faster, changes very rapidly. So the central nervous system could be a rate limiter, the development of the central nervous system or the myelination. Muscular strength, muscular endurance, right? If I'm going to walk all the way across the room, I have to be able to contract my postural muscles the entire way. Otherwise, halfway across the room, I fall over. Okay? So it's not just strength, because strength is a one-off kind of contraction idea. It's endurance as well. I have to be able to contract those muscles for a period of time. So when you're looking at this chapter all the time, be thinking, what might be the rate limiters here? What's the thing that affects whether I get the skill or not? So if I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to walk, I have to be able to control all these wobbly bits. Right? We have one of the nice things about being bipedal upright is we've got hip sockets that are quite wide that allow a lot of movement of the femur within that hip socket. So our range of motion is quite wide. Well, that's great, but not when I don't have it under control. Okay? So the brain's got to learn what to do about that. And one of the things that they found is that a rate limiter for posture and balance in order to get postural control, which helps me to balance, I have to be able to pull together the sensory information that I'm getting, so from my muscle spindles, from the tendon organs, visual information that I'm receiving, with what I'm telling the muscles to do. Okay. So when you watch infants standing, the brain is all the time tweaking posture, tweaking muscle tone, tweaking contractions, and trying to establish relationships between the sensory information it's receiving and what it tells the muscles to do in response to that information. We call that coupling. In fact, then what we see is that posture and balance themselves, the development of posture and balance, becomes a rate limiter, right? I can't walk if I don't have this under control, right? So until I've learned how to stand up and make sure the hips are contracted and under control, I can't shift my weight in order to walk, because when I shift my weight, everything's just going to give way. Right? So posture and balance kind of become rate limiters for the next set of motor attainment. We also see other environmental constraints. What do the parents do? Right? We talked a little bit about lying on our tummy versus lying on our back on Monday. Right? Tummy time is important, but culturally, for quite a long time, tummy time was sort of the, the bone, you know, because we thought that it led to sudden infant death syndrome. Another one you'll see is first child syndrome. Right? 
not a disease, but mothers tend to be highly, highly protective of the first child because they're new at it, they're learning something. They don't quite know what's safe and what's not safe. Right? If, if mum was an only child and she didn't watch siblings grow up, she's not going to know what this baby does or doesn't do. Okay? So mums tend to do a lot of this. Right? Well, that's great, but all the time I'm carrying it, it's not learning to move on its own. So what we see with first child syndrome is that sometimes those children are a little bit delayed in attaining motor milestones because mum's a bit protective. Right? It's not deliberate, it's just an environmental constraint. You don't get it with second children because by the time they have the second one, the first one's walking and they're trying to be pulled in all directions and they don't have time to pick the baby up and carry it around with them. Right? So you don't get second child syndrome very often. And not everybody, you don't see first child syndrome all the time. It depends upon the person. But those are the kinds of things. What's going on in the home? What's going on with the parents? Are there siblings? What kind of flooring do they have? What's the furniture like? All of these things impact what you might see an individual child do. Right. Okay, let's see. What else do I want to talk to you about? Oh yes, let's have a look at this. Alright, so let's see if I actually found so I'm not very good at searching the internet, but let's see if I actually did find what I was looking for. Alright, so this idea of the coupling, the sensory and motor <coughs> coupling, they've done a lot of work using what they call a moving room. And so a moving room is a three-sided box, basically. And you stand in this three-sided box, and the box is on runners, and they move the box. So what that does is it gives your brain two different conflicting pieces of sensory information. Because my eyes tell my brain that I'm moving. You ever sat? Well, you guys probably haven't sat in a train, but you've sat in a traffic jam. Well, possibly, depending where you grew up. You sat in a traffic jam and the car next to you moves, and you do this, right? But your car's stationary, okay? That's the same thing. Your eyes give your brain information that you're moving, although your kinesthetic sensory organs are telling your brain you're not moving. Well, humans tend to be visually dominant. So what we see in that instance is you do this when there was no need for you to do that because you're sitting perfectly stationary. So they use that with the moving room experiments. They put you in this three-sided box, you stand there, and they move the room backwards and forwards. So depending on who you do that with, you see different things. And they'll stand you on a force platform often because what you get is this kind of thing going on. You get postural sway. Depending upon the person, the postural sway might be quite small or it might be quite dramatic. When they do that with young children, it gives us a very good idea of what the brain is trying to learn. So I'm really, really hoping that this is going to be a clip of a baby in the moving room. Oh. And it's not going to be. Okay, let's go back and see if we can find a different one. Oh, that's a paper. That's a very good paper. Alright, here's a picture. It's not as much fun. So, if you can um, look at, they've got this diagram in our textbook. 
But if you can, try to find some film, and I'll see if I can find a belly clip for Friday. What you see with infants is that when you move the room, they sway quite dramatically. In fact, a lot of them will actually just sit down because the brain goes, what the heck? And it just goes, okay, I'm not dealing with this. I'm just going to get really stable now, <laughs> right? So while their brain is trying to learn this coupling, they'll just sit down or they'll get quite upset because unconsciously the brain can't work out it's all this information doesn't match up so it just sh kind of shuts off it just starts crying or it'll sit down if i watch adults then we'll do this one of the interesting things when we film them is where do you initiate and control the sway do you control the sway here or at your knees, or at your ankles. Because there's quite a link then with the risk of falling. So when you put older people in, where they initiate the sway and how they control the sway is slightly different to what you see when you will put you guys in the room. So it's a really fascinating set of experiments. They've even done it with very young babies who, are, who aren't standing up yet. They put them in a chair and they put them in the moving room and they actually sway sitting in their baby chair. And it's really a fascinating set of information because it gives us a window <coughs> into what the brain is trying to do in order to make movement possible. Movement is highly, highly complex. People will tell you you're just a PE teacher or you're just a coach. There's nothing just about what you do. Okay? Moving, teaching someone to move, helping someone to improve their movement is highly, highly complex and technical. So you've got to understand a lot of things People think we just stand there and yell at kids. There is tons and tons of stuff going on that you have to understand to yell at kids well. Right? To do the job well. The more you read, the more you look at the textbook, the more you start to explore outside the textbook, the better you'll be at being able to identify problems, correct problems, be developmentally appropriate in your teaching practices. Right? It's not just get a big cage of balls out and chuck them out and tell the kids to throw them around. That's not what this is about. It's way more complicated than that. Okay. All right, so questions on chapter six. Anything you're not sure about going on now? Alright, make sure you have a look at it, okay, and then on Friday we will start chapter 7.